First order of business, the Pledge of Allegiance. Next order of business, are there any additions or deletions to the agenda? <coughs> no? Okay, let's move on forward. Um, approval of the minutes. <coughs> Motion to approve? Second. Motion to approve by Jordan, seconded by Chip. All in favor? Aye. 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 That's unanimous. Next order of business, public hearing, number A, consideration of land development regulations, LDR amendments, Chapter 926 regarding changes to palm credits for canopy trees. This matter is legislative. Stan. <coughs> thank, oh, thank you, Mr. Chair. We're, there's, so there's no uh, swearing in or anything of this sort? Not okay. Sure. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chair. For the record, I'm Ryan Sweeney, Senior Planner with the Current Development Division of the Community Development Department. Tonight, we have a county initiated LDR amendment for to Chapter 926 regarding changes to palm tree credits or palm credits for canopy trees. Uh, brief background on how we arrived here tonight. Um, this proposed LDR amendment represents the third and final installment of LDR changes based on recommendations from the Development Review and Permit Processing Advisory Committee or the committee. Uh, we, you guys uh, saw and considered and moved along two previous installments over the last year, year plus. Uh, the committee ultimately sunsetted on January 16, 2019. On March 26, 2019, the board considered the draft amendment <coughs> and authorized staff to initiate the formal adoption process. And therefore, staff has drafted changes to provide more flexibility within the existing LDRs and supports <coughs> the proposed LDR amendment. Um, we'll jump into the proposed ordinance, but real quick, the current LDRs allow some palm tree species to be substituted or counted as uh, standard or typical canopy tree species. Two examples of the four that are listed is the royal palm and the Bismarck palm. And, and uh, kind of as I already explained, current LDRs allow certain palm tree species to be used in place of uh, conventional canopy trees like a live oak or a holly tree. Uh, the current LDRs only list a total of four specific palm tree types, and there are uh, there's probably thousands of palm tree species throughout the world, um, many of which provide uh, are capable of providing a large frond canopy. Um, so under the current uh, proposed amendment, an applicant or a developer can propose a another type of palm tree type for staff's consideration. We'll keep the four uh, types that are listed, so those are essentially a guarantee or, or, or a, a, a set list, but uh, other non-listed species can be proposed for staff's consideration. And, and this approach provides flexibility rather than attempting an exhaustive list. And ultimately, staff's recommendation is that the Planning and Zoning Commission recommend that the board adopt a proposed palm tree credit amendment ordinance. Any questions of staff? None? Uh, I, I do, yeah. Yes. Uh, what are the four that are listed now? Sure, uh, thank you, Dr. Day. It's uh, Royal Palm, well, I'll use common names, <laughs> Roystonia, uh, Bismarck, Canary Island Date Palm, and I'm gonna, uh, Sylvester. So if you look at, if you look at canopy cover, any one of those compared to a live oak, the canopies don't compare at all. That's true, Mr. Chair, Dr. Day, but live oak is probably the broadest canopy. We have a narrow upright, like bald cypress and, and magnolia. So but can canopy is a loose term. Mm -hmm. Okay. So uh, royal palms are cold sensitive. And of course, we learned that in the 80s uh, and 90s. And so I, I firmly believe in climate change, but would we allow royal palms to be substituted in now, despite the fact that they might be lost in a freeze? Uh, Mr. Chair, Dr. Day, under our current LDRs, they, they are still listed as one of the four that are already allowed. So is Washingtonian palm one of the ones that are uh, a possible substitute? Uh, Dr. Day, uh, no, th those are not listed. And uh, they're also not doing that great around here, I don't believe. <laughs> and if I could just interject for a moment, um, Stan Bowling, Community Development Director, just, just so that you know, if um, 
for some reason a, a required tree were to die for any reason, including a freeze, which I'm not sure we're going to see, see the 80s again for a while, um, then it would have to be replaced. So it is, it is kind of it is at risk, but I think that risk is diminishing, and uh, we, we've seen it done successfully. Also, uh, just to let you all know, in the rest of the landscape code, there's a maximum of 50% of your canopy trees can consist of palms or palm tree clusters. So there'll always be other types of native trees, including live oaks, but exactly like what Ryan said, in some places it's, uh, you have a more upright species like a holly and that sort of thing. So some places it's appropriate to have the really broad spread and in other places it's, you know, you, you still want a decent sort of canopy, but it, it makes sense to have not as large of a canopy in some other landscape areas. So, so is that replacement for the life of the tree or just a certain amount of time? <coughs> after? No, it, it is, it's a requ if it's a required tree, it has to be maintained for the duration of, of the facility, the, the site. So it could be 10 years, it could be 20 years from now. They have to maintain it. And w if they replace it after a certain amounts of time, we have certain size replacement trees they have to use. So it's not, not back to, a, say, a 2-inch or 3-inch tree. Any further questions? And that's a question I had regarding the, the height of the palms themselves. I know we have other requirements for other trees. Right. And what's, uh, like Ryan was saying, if you, if you look at this particular language, there's different, you know, clear trunk heights, uh, ways of measuring uh, palm trees. And some of the species, like a Bismarck, has a very short trunk and a, and a very wide kind of girth. Uh, so it's appropriate in some places and not in others. So we actually kind of measure depending on the species, but we've got some general guidelines in here. That's right. And, and I, like I said, Mr. Bignano's uh, memory, but I vaguely remember in Sebastian the tree ordinances that they required, and did they even allow palm trees? Yes, they did. Okay. Yes, they did. Okay. They allowed palm trees. Okay. So, so the purpose of this change is to give county more flexibility in the design of these buffers? It is what we're, when we did this change in 2010, there were really just kind of four species that people were using, and now we're seeing a lot more varieties being available and people wanting to use different ones. And then there are, I mean, I don't even know necessarily the difference between a genus and a species and some of these are so close. Uh, so we, I think this kind of way of, of doing it allows us not to try, to try an exhaustive list because we, we, won't, we won't ever get it right. As far as right. I can tell, and this will be decided on a case by case basis. Right. And by I think staff. you know, once once we probably see some species, we'll probably have a list <coughs> you know, of what's what's already kind of gone through. Um, but so this will be a staff level decision. Yes. And if the developer or the other party disagrees with your decision, do they have recourse? They can come to you all. Any any interpretation of our land development regulations can come to you all. Um, but, but the, the, the existing list remains. So if they want a guarantee, they already know there's the, the four there. Right. They can appeal community development director decision to the planning and zoning commission. Your decision is appealable <coughs> to the board of county commissioners. Anything further? All right, I'll open up the public hearing. Anybody would like to speak, please stand up and be sworn in. I have none. Close the public hearing. General. Motion to approve staff's recommendation. Motion to approve. <coughs> by Chip. Second. Seconded by Dr. Day. All in favor? Aye. 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 It's unanimous. Next order of business. Consideration <coughs> of a request by Gary Middleton to amend the land development regulations, chapter 971, regulations for specific land uses by changing the maximum <coughs> building height for self-storage facilities in CG, general commercial zoning district, this matter is legislative. Staff. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Again, for the record, I am Ryan Sweeney, Senior Planner with the County Community Development Department. Tonight, this is a um, applicant-initiated LDR amendment to Chapter 971 by changing the maximum building height for self-service storage facilities in the CG Zoning District. Uh, background on, on how we arrived at this LDR amendment. Uh, this amendment or application was submitted by Bruce Barquette on behalf of a potential developer of a multi-story self-storage facility in the CG zoning district. Initially, um, the height issue that we're going to discuss was, um, was brought up during a pre-application meeting in October 2017. And again, uh, we discussed with Bruce a few months ago 
about possibly moving forward with an LDR amendment to change those requirements. Ultimately, staff reviewed, or, uh, staff reviewed proposed code changes to clarify proposed criteria, allow a graduated increase in building height, and staff supports the proposed amendment. Some additional background. Currently, self-storage facilities in the CG district must meet the specific land use criteria in, in chapter ni or section 971. And one of those criteria limits the overall building height for self self storage facilities in the CG district to a maximum of 15 feet. And by doing that, it essentially limits all self storage facilities in the CG district to single story buildings. Um, staff admits the current language is not abundantly clear and was established prior to corridor requirements in the 1990s to avoid essentially tall warehouse buildings in the CG retail district. Under the proposed ordinance, it, it first clarifies sort of the unclear language that individual storage units shall have a maximum interior ceiling height of 15 feet. Um, it also allows a graduated increase in the overall building height based on separation distance from adjacent residential lot lines, which some might re refer to as a wedding cake or a tiered approach. And the graduated height increase is essentially if any portion of the self-storage facility is located within 150 feet of a residential lot line, the maximum building height remains at 15 feet. The portion or, or all portions that are between 150 and 199 feet set back from a residential lot line is, is limited to 25 feet. And then if the self-storage facility or building is greater than 200 feet from a residential lot line, it's, it's capped at 35 feet, which is the max building height for the CG zoning district. And it's probably also to point, important to point out that although we do refer to the wedding cake or tiered approach, uh, most CG zoning district does not directly abut residential zoning. So more often than not, the default will be the, the 35 foot max height. So um, moving forward also, the ordinance recognizes that more recent multi-story self-storage facilities do provide enhanced architectural design and aesthetic appeal. And the CG zoning sites or, or CG sites are subject to corridor uh, architectural requirements. So ultimately, um, this proposed amendment will allow multi-story self-storage facilities within the CG district subject to, again, the, the separation distances outlined uh, together with reasonable building height and architectural controls already in place. And staff's recommendation is that the Planning and Z Zoning Commission recommend that the BCC adopt the proposed self-storage ordinance. Thank you. Any questions? I have a few questions. Um, I was trying to call out 917.12 on my computer, but apparently the cellular data is not, uh, <laughs> not getting it. Um, a couple of quick questions. I went into 917.12, and again, not having it in front of me, there was, I think, subsection three, which dealt with storage facilities in a CG district, which is where we are. <coughs> and right under that is subsection four, which deals with storage facilities in a CL district, yeah, CL district, which uh, is by special exception. And in the criteria under those, under sec section four, uh, there were several triggers <clears throat> or several requirements that were triggered by the property where the storage facility was going to be built, whether it was adjacent to residential property. And in subsection four, that residential property is defined as property which is zoned residential or property which is zoned for single family residential. Here, the amendment that you're proposing uses the phrase, instead of the zoning phrase, it uses uh, the phrase a residential lot line. So my first question is, is that different from property which is zoned residential? And if so, why the difference? because it seems to me there is a difference. Thank you, Mr. Chair Allen. Um, so the difference is that this would apply to any residential property, whether it's zoned or used as residential. So in the case where you have a, an existing non-conforming single family home that's in a commercial zoning district, 
they're afforded these protections as well. Uh, if they weren't, if they were zoned, for example, if they were zoned CG, but they're still a single family home, if we limit it to just single family zoning, they won't be afforded <coughs> these protections. Okay, and I, and I did kind of see my way to that conclusion. But I guess the other question that I had was, let's imagine you have a, a parcel of property, a large parcel, you know, pick a number, 10, 20 acres, and it's zoned residential, but it hasn't been platted. There are no individual, I don't think, <coughs> residential lot lines. How does, how does this proposed amendment square with that fact situation? Right. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Alan, and, and we try to we try to specify by saying residential lot line because kind of working backwards in an existing scenario, if there's a tract or a right of way on the periphery, we would measure to the actual lot line. What you're saying is in that case, it would be measured to the property boundary, the out the external boundary. OK, but I, I guess I'm, I'm envisioning the term lot line to mean that the, the individual lots have been defined within a residentially zoned piece of property. And I don't know, if I could be wrong, I don't know. But if you've got a 20 acre parcel that's not developed, not platted, there are no defined lot lines inside that parcel. Right. So what our, happens here? Sure, so our definition of lot is a lot or parcel and it's, it's not in reference to any particular size. So you're right, I think a, a common use of the word lot might might be you know platted lot small you know one building site sort of thing but it could be any size lot or parcel so our definition is broad enough if i went back to the definition yep. section of the ldr yep. and looked at lot yes. it would include parcel lot or parcel okay yep. so that that takes care of that concern second question i had um in the application that was submitted it said um, that the proposed divisions would, it says, and provide compatibility landscaping for any adjacent residential properties. And then I looked again at the subsection three and nine seventeen twelve that we're dealing with, which I don't think has landscaping requirements in it. And I looked at four, which dealt with in the CL district, and it does have buffering landscaping requirements. So given that the applicant said that the proposed revision would include landscape buffering, and given that we have landscape buffering in subsection four de dealing with uh, CL districts, why do we not have landscaping in this proposed amendment? Thanks, Mr. Chair. Uh, Mr. Blackledge, uh, originally the, hit, the first brush, if you will, did include a similar landscape buffer proposal. Um, we, through coordination with staff, we decided to go with the in, um, the graduated building height approach as opposed to the buffer. Um, so the, the landscape buffer portion was removed and the graduated building height section was instead provided. So the, the, the application didn't get updated. We, we rarely, mm -hmm. usually we just keep the initial application, but but the, la the landscape buffer provision in the um, CEL, the special exception version, remains and is, is a different scenario. So in other words, you ended up substituting the, the wedding cake situation in place of landscape buffering. Correct. Were they necessarily oh, mutually sure. exclusive? I mean, was no. And let me clarify: there, there, are, there are still landscape buffering requirements. You know, whether whether it be perimeter buffering or, uh, well, and again, in this scenario, a CG to RS zoning in and of itself is going to have what's a zoning compatibility buffer. Um, the difference was that under the initial proposal, they wanted to push, be able to push the 35 right up against that buffer. So it would only be a 25 foot separation. Instead, we still have those buffer requirements based on zoning, but we also have the graduated uh, building height increase. Okay. And I guess I might as well keep going. The last question I had, um, the, the, <clears throat> the staff memo talked about the, I guess the fear or the prospect of a big square kind of ugly building, three stories high, and basically uh, said you don't have to worry about that because number one, current or modern designs show very nice prop, uh, buildings. And I don't get a lot of comfort out of that because future's designs may change. Right. 
but you also said uh, corridors have um, their own aesthetics requirements so we could be comfortable in thinking that we're not gonna have these big ugly square buildings. But are we limited to, to these buildings in corridors which require those aesthetic uh, or which include those aesthetic requirements or could it be outside of a corridor requirement and therefore the prospect of big ugly sure. square sure. buildings? Uh, sure, Mr. Chair Allen. Um, the, well, two things, one, I, I'd say 99 if not 100% of all CG sites are in a corridor. Um, and then the other thing is by keeping the, the unit height limited to 15 feet, we're not gonna get a single, we're still not gonna get a single story big box over 15 feet. Um, so the two combined together still, you know, again, we have the quarter. If, if, yeah, if they decide, hey, let's skimp and dial back the, arch the architectures, well, we still have the corridor requirements, which essentially still require what you see nowadays, but also the unit height limitation keeps the single story to being no more than, in other words, you're not gonna see a single story 35 foot tall self-storage facility. Okay, but, but basically you're telling me 99% of the time, any facility like this is gonna be in a corridor which requires aesthetic. Yeah, I, I don't think I can even think of a CG site that's not in a corridor. It, it's 100%. Okay, 100%. 100%. <laughs> all, all the CG, our CG zoning districts are only in, along very prominent you know, major roadways. We don't have them back off of that. And every one of those in the urbanized area is covered with the other corridor or some of the other requirements. So they're all covered. How do you get the stored items up on the second and third floor? Big elevator. <laughs> is it all interior? It's yeah. not exterior forklifts no. or things like no, that? No, no, it's interior elevators is what they use for them. Yeah. Sorry to take the time, but okay, sir. questions. Yeah. Um, you, you did a good job in, in your report of explaining the original LDR and why that 15 foot was confusing. <laughs> and so in that, in, and, and you explained that what that means is it's 15 feet from the finished floor to the finished ceiling. So if it's a two-story building, is that also 15 feet from the finished floor to the finished ceiling? And the heights you're talking about are the outside exterior heights. Correct. So if you have a three-story building, a three-story building, that's 30 feet just in interior height. Um, how do you get to 35 feet there? Uh, Mr. Chair, Dr. Day, the, the 15 is maximum, and then you have a 35 maximum. So in that scenario, you'd probably be looking more like 10 foot interior heights with two to three feet of floor height in between. So the 15 is maximum, not minimum. So the heights you're talking about are maximum outside heights. Correct, for the overall building, yes. For the overall building. So if they want a three story, then the interior heights are going to come down to what, 10? 10? 10, 10 plus two feet of floor in between going to probably be about a nine floor with the interior ceiling and then you have your floor joists and it continues up then through your reach your 35 feet so all the interior is going to be nine floor high can you put can you put three floors and and maintain yes. that 35 foot absolutely you yeah can. yeah absolutely yeah okay. yeah mr chair dr day a typical hotel is kind of the same scenario a three-story hotel has that same interior dimension uh, any further questions uh, yes it, I could. Are there any other uh, building types in these CG districts right now that have height limitations below 35 feet? I don't think so. Yeah. No, I think that this one, because of the type of building it was presumed to be because of the use, and it's not a retail or an office use, uh, again, the, the presumption was we don't want, well, really two things. One was the aesthetics, which we talked about, a very tall building that at that time would have been not articulated metal skin and that sort of thing, not allowed now. The other was the possibility that if somebody put in a really tall, and, and called it self-storage, it really would have more commercial characteristics if it had a very tall interior ceiling. They might, the use might drift to something that's a type of commercial warehouse use that's not allowed. So uh, I think that was, the, that was the original purpose for it. And so this is the only building type I'm aware of that doesn't have the general 35 foot height limitation. Okay, thank you. And is the, is the 35 foot height limitation measured from the finished floor to the gable, to the roof ridge? How is that 35 feet measured? Mr. Chair, Dr. Day, it's actually, it's measured from the finished floor to the highest 
interior ceiling height and then we do have an allowance for a parapet or a roof mounted structure to go another 15 so um, yeah typically it the true up to the coping or if you have a slope roof to the top would be 40 to 45 feet and is that same for yeah that's the same how it's measured throughout the surrounding but yeah yeah say like a, again for a hotel it's measured to essentially the drop ceiling and then you have a parapet it's ultimately to the top is 40 feet Further questions? Uh, clarifications, but um, I, I'm glad to see the potential of less sprawl, let's say, is, and uh, more maximum of the uses of the site. But the question I have here is the comment, the self-service storage facilities shall not exceed three acres gross area. Are we talking the buildings? Are we talking the entire parcel? And then does that three acres that we're talking about, if it is the buildings, um, what about the number of units? I mean, because if you can go up to 35 foot, then I mean, you could potentially triple amount of unit, well, potentially triple amount of units going there. Sure, Mr. Chair, uh, Mr. Landers, a um, couple things. So the three acre limitations is, a, is an existing criteria and it, it is for the overall site. So if you have a three acre site, then you have a 40% building coverage. Uh, the other thing is we don't we don't set a max unit or density that's a function of the size of the units some have a lot of small units some have some bigger units so th that's more of a market controlled condition but yes you can go a full three stories now thereby increasing the amount of units e effectively but you're still limited to three acres we're not going to see a proliferation of self-storage Oh, and maybe or, or maybe one three acre piece at a time. Well, if you have a smaller piece of property and you can go up, then it's right. It's a more efficient way of, of using the property. Okay. And CG's expensive, <laughs> so. All right. Any further questions? <coughs> okay. Open up public hearing. Anybody wishes to speak, please stand up and be sworn in. My name is Bruce Barquette. I'm an attorney who practice at 756 Beachland Boulevard. And yeah, hey Bruce, you got to be sworn in. No, I don't. No, we don't. Okay, no, 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 not giving evidence. It's just for, it's just for evidence, and I'm I don't, I'm not giving evidence. Okay. I'm, actually, I'm just going to answer questions. I think you guys <laughs> already asked them all, and I wasn't even going to stand up, but I've got a client here, so I've got to do something. Well, have that. Questions, please let me know. Thank you. Anybody from the public like to come forward and speak? Okay. Close the public hearing. Gentlemen, any further questions? <coughs> Move approval. Motion to approve by Mr. Blackwich. Second. Seconded by Dr. Day. All in favor? Aye. 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 Motion approves unanimously. Next order of business, county initiated request to amend, update the text of the capital improvements element of the county's comprehensive plan to modify certain concurrency management requirements modify certain transportation levels of service standards, modify and add new policies to allow for more <coughs> effective implementation of the concurrency management, and to update the transportation element to modify certain transportation's level of service standards, and to remove and replace outdated text and data and maps. This matters legislative. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Again, for the record, Stan Bowling, Community Development Director. I'm gonna say a few things and turn it over to Bill Shute our long range uh, planning section chief uh, to go through the, uh, the proposal. But just to, to give you all a little bit of context, uh, I think I've mentioned this in the past, uh, but a few years ago, the Board of County Commissioners uh, had a decision to make from the state as to whether or not to do a, a really exhaustive sort of evaluation and appraisal report to update the entire comprehensive plan sort of all at the same time. State legislation changed a few years ago. It used to be a really kind of regimented process. Every so many years you had deadlines and so forth. And we did that twice in, in the county since the 1990 plan was approved. Um, the Board of County Commissioners, like a lot of other local governments, decided uh, not to go through that process, which is an option now, uh, but, but we delayed it. And one of the things that we gained by doing that, it was always awkward timing for us in Indian River County for when ours were due because we were always way behind on good census data. So now uh, the target date is probably 2022, 2023, when we have really good census data is when we need to really do that comprehensive evaluation and appraisal report. So in the meantime, what we've been doing is uh, going through the last few years, a few sets of updates and changes to the comprehensive plan 
uh, to make sure that it's up to date, knowing that it's still it's going to be a few years before we do a full sort of evaluation. So we have updated the economic development um, element, the future land use element, recreation, open space, solid waste, uh, water and sewer. Um, you all probably remember some of these, the coastal management element, we, we uh, had a, a mandatory uh, requirement to add something in there. And this time we're doing the capital improvements element and the transportation element. And I think when we get through with this series of updates, we'll be in, in good shape for several years until we do a more full uh, reappraisal, which is, is necessary, but we'll have good data to do it. It'll be better timing for us then. Uh, with respect to this one, a lot of the driving force uh, for the update is uh, uh, the long-range transportation plan. I know our Board of County Commissioners sits on the MPO, all five of them, Metropolitan Planning Organization. You all don't get to see all the good countywide transportation planning efforts that they do. Um, MPO staff helped us a lot in this update because a lot of the update in the transportation element and some parallel things in the capital improvements element really dealt with the long-range transportation plan adoption and, and getting up-to-date data. Um, so they really helped us and we thank the MPO staff. Some of them are here um, if, if we've got some, uh, some detailed questions. So uh, this update uh, does have some substance to it, certainly besides just updating it. Uh, it's got some substantive uh, policy changes based on some conditions that we have come across in our transportation planning. And we'll be going over that uh, during Bill's presentation. But I want to kind of give you all the big picture context of this update. All right. Yep. <clears throat> all right. Thank you very much, Stan. Uh, as Stan said, I'm Bill Shute, uh, Chief of Long Range Planning. And <laughs> looking at uh, the presentation, so we, we have two elements of the overall comprehensive plan that we're updating. Uh, proposing updates two. that's the capital improvements element and the transportation element. And with comprehensive plan amendments, there's a set process um, in statute that outlines what you have to do and the time frames behind it. So we're at the, the first step where we initiated an application and now we're having a public hearing before the Planning and Zoning Commission. Uh, afterwards, the, the next step would be to transmit the public hearing, um, well, transmit it to the, to, the to the Board of County Commissioners for review and we're looking at May of June, May or June of 2019, then the application is transmitted to state and regional review agencies. <coughs> after, after that, the state and regional review agencies send their comments to the county and to, st to the state land planning agency. Um, and the next step after that, you go to the Board of County Commissioners for a final public hearing after you to, to consider the comments and, and consider the proposal for ultimate adoption. And then the adopted amendment transmit is transmitted to the state and regional review agencies and state land planning agency. So, so the purpose tonight is to, as stated, was to amend the text of the capital improvements element and the text of the transportation element to recognize changed conditions. Um, we're here to implement BCC direction for updating and simplifying the single family concurrency review procedures. Uh, to set some interim level of service standards for County Road 510 and 37th Street, and to also to update and incorporate currently adopted long-range transportation plan references. Uh, the transportation plan was re relatively recently updated, so we're, many of the updates that you've seen in the, the document itself relate back to that, um, and update other related items. And we're also looking at it you know, once we pull in the, the new data, the data from the transportation plan, long-range transportation plan, we also have to look at the policies, objectives, and general text to make sure they remain up to date overall. So looking at the capital improvements element, that's the one with the, the least amount of updates before tonight. And really the first one is just a minor text update, correcting a year that was incorrect in the previous version. Policy 3.5, uh, that's one of the, the main updates of the focus tonight is the change of the adopted level service standard for County Road 510 and 66 Avenue, from, excuse me, from 66 Avenue to US Highway 1 and also 37th Street from US Highway 1 to Indian River Boulevard. And the proposal is to change it from level service D, which is the, the standard that we have for <coughs> all trip grant funded roads as well as all freeway, arterial, and collector roadways in the county and to, to change it to D plus 20. 
with, with the caveat or with the, the condition in there that it would revert back to the level service D after planned road improvement projects are completed. Because in, in both cases, there are, are planned road projects and you know there's, there's delays, I guess the with the County Road 510 segment, we have that as being a state funded project. And so there's some delays associated with that. And then we also have 37th Street, um, which you know we're looking at two alternatives really with that project, but it, it's scheduled in the capital improvements element in years four and five currently. <coughs> with respect to text amendments, it, the text amendments are to exempt all single family homes, not, not just the pre-1990 lots from concurrency review on a permit by permit basis. So when, when the, this was originally implemented in the concurrency, it was just the pre-1999 lots. So it's proposed to revise to simplify and make it all consistent with just all the, all the single family platted lots as well as that are unplatted. With respect to transportation element, uh, as Dan stated, uh, the MPO staff had a, a major role in, in, in updating this and providing the edits and we have two members in the audience. We have Phil Matson, we have Jim Mann. They're very helpful and very thankful for them. <laughs> and looking at the policy 1.1, that, that is consistent with the previous, on the previous slide I mentioned, the level of service standards. So there's some duplication between some of the elements in the comprehensive plan. So that policy is proposed to be amended. Policy 1.4 is to remove building, building permit approval for single family development from concurrency review. Um, so that's kind of similar to the capital improvements element, reviewing some of those changes. Uh, policy 1.4, it's actually a very long policy, so there's a couple more bullet points. It provides public works director approval for accepted traffic capacity special analysis, and there's a correction in there to uh, focus on the time period of the capital improvements plan from five years instead of seven years. Policy 1.6 is to revise the time period for updating traffic impact fee schedules to be consistent with county's recently modified impact fee ordinance. So, so recently, uh, the impact fee ordinance was modified at the Board of County Commissioners. So the amendment to this policy is just to make it consistent with that ordinance change. Policy 1.7 is changed from imposing by 2015 all or part of the one to five cent local option gas tax to consider imposing the optional gas tax by 2023. Um, so there's always funding questions with, with tra uh, transportation projects, but, um, but we're looking at it, you know, imposing it by a later deadline at this point and, and giving the board the flexibility of the option to to, to go that path. Now, policy 1.10, add to development standards the option of other means of shared access and interconnections as an alternative providing service frontage roads. So right now the policy has the, the allowance for frontage roads, but you know, in actuality, a lot of these development projects and things that occur in the community, there's interconnections, different points in, in those projects. <coughs> policy 1.11, change the basis for parking requirements from just parking studies to something that's based on the Institute of Traffic traffic engineers, parking data and parking studies. So we're focused on a, a well-known standard. Policy 1.12, uh, changed reference from the 2030 cost feasible long range transportation plan to 2040 cost feasible plan to recognize the adopted 24 LRTP. So that, this goes back to the beginning of the presentation. So we're, we're incorporating a lot of changes to do that, to that document itself. Um, some minor ad edits just to policy 2.4, spelling out an acronym that was in there. Policy 2.5, update shared access requirements to state that other means of shared access interconnections are, are acceptable. Objective three is change completion date for acquiring all county right of way for county collector and arterial roads and mass transit corridors within the, so we say USA up there, but that's the acronym for urban service area in this case, <laughs> from 2025 to 2035 consistent with the adopted 24 long range transportation plan. Uh, policy 3.1 revised to allow general right of way with standards to be modified by FDOT or the public works director, provided drainage is adequately handled. So we're just looking at some more flexibility in that policy. <laughs> policy 5.5 was a typographical error that was corrected. Policy 6.2 changed the frequency of meetings with FDOT staff to review various roadway standards from regularly to as needed. Policy 6.4 is to 
to delete policy for establishing tra traffic operations subcommittee of the MPO Technical Advisory Committee. And it's a separate subcommittee, not necessary. And I, <laughs> I always joke with MPO, they have a lot of committees. <laughs> Um, policy 6.5, 6.6, and 6.7, just renumbering. Policy 10.1, change long range transportation plan references from 2030 cost feasible plan. Again, another one referencing the 2040 cost feasible plan. And looking at the text updates overall, you know, w with a lot of these changes, it just triggered other changes in the document. So we had to update the table of contents. There was numerous maps that were updated that were pulled in. Various tables, outdated reference throughout the entire document. And as mentioned, we have statistical data and monetary figures and re recent project information. So all those things were added to this update. With respect to the consistency with comprehensive plan, so with, with future land use element requests, uh, element amendment requests, excuse me, uh, you need to be or meet one of four criteria. In this case, of the four criteria listed on the slide, this one meets a substantial change in circumstance. And drilling down a little bit, those change circumstances, we're looking at the information references and in some processes that are now out of date. So it's making corrections there. And as mentioned a couple times in this PowerPoint, the level of service issue, you know, we're looking at that as a, a, a temporary measure due to the delay in those projects, just to adjust the level of service. And with that, the recommendation, staff recommends that the Planning and Zoning Commission recommend that the Board of County Commissioners approve the proposed text amendment for transmittal to state and regional review agencies. Thank you, Bill. Thank you. Any questions? I have some questions. Please. Um, I'm trying to understand the larger picture here. If, um, if someone comes in with a project which is going to have a traffic impact on 510 to US 1, and we're already above our plan level of service, can that project go forward? Can it get a concurrency certificate and be built? Right, good, good question. So a couple of things. Let me tell you how we measure concurrency and, and how often we, we do that first. So the concurrency management system, we once a year do traffic counts. I say we, it's public works, does traffic counts extensively. And we have over 200 segments of roadways, a major roadway network that we measure, including 510, but lots of other collector roads and arterial roads. And we measure traffic in each direction. So we look at our level of service standard is peak direction, whether it's east or west or north or south. Uh, but we look at all those directions, each lane essentially, or each lane direction. Um, and it's measured for the peak season and peak hour. Sometimes, most of the time that's PM, sometimes it's AM, um, and peak season. So when traffic counts are conducted, it takes months to conduct these each, each year. And so there are adjustment factors. Let's say you take uh, a segment count in early May. That's not peak season. And there are tables and ways to, to recalculate that and get it back to, say, a February, March type of peak season condition. And that process takes months to actually gather that data. Uh, sometimes there are some anomalies. Uh, Public Works may have to go back out and measure and recalculate because there was a road closure or there was an accident or something like that when the data were taken. So, so we're getting that once a year. And once a year, we, we get an update on what the actual traffic conditions are. Uh, that gets factored into our concurrency management system once a year. So for 2019, we don't actually know <laughs> what, what the current traffic counts are. We won't really get that data till fall. So as we wrote this amendment right now, 37th Street and 510 in 2018 were not over capacity. We anticipate that they will be. By the time this amendment goes all the way through and we get that, get that data, the new traffic counts, we will think that we'll be there. Um, so, we're, so we're very close in 2018, we think we'll be over in 2019, which is why we think this is necessary to change the level of service standard. Now, back, I'm getting back to your question. I just wanna kinda give you the big picture. As, so besides the, the current um, the current trips 
and the capacity of that particular link, and different links have different capacities based on different roadway characteristics. Uh, we also look at vested trips. Is a, is a project in, and have they paid their impact fees, and, and have they vested uh, for concurrency? And, and, and that's essentially a reservation on the system, and we take that into account too. We have very few projects doing that now ahead of time. We did during the boom. We don't anymore, and we don't especially since the 2011 state legislation changes, which essentially say, you may have heard this a few years ago when this went through the legislation and has never been changed by the state, pay and go method. If an individual comes in and pays their fair share, which in our case is their impact fees, uh, we can't look at uh, strictly our segment by segment concurrency capacity to, uh, th to say no. Now we have a level of service standard for intersection analyses or we also look at intersections. That's not concurrency, that's a separate level of service requirement. So we actually look at both. We look at the segment and at the intersection. Um, it's conceivable that you could have a project that wouldn't work uh, without offsite improvements that they would have to do for an intersection. Uh, they may have to uh, partner with the county for some improvements that might be very close to the project, especially intersections uh, that would have to be done. Um, but um, there are very few ways outside of an intersection problem that you could actually, based on concurrency, say you can't, you can't get your permit uh, if they pay their impact fees and they pay their fair share since 2011. Well, what consequence is there or what result is there um, for being over a level of service in your plan, right? Any yeah. Well, well, our ordin our comp plan or ordinance st still we apply these standards basically to ourselves and, and our transportation planning, and we're going to look at every traffic study that comes in and see what's needed in terms of driveways, intersections, offsite improvements, and so forth. What we have found is the only two places where we foresee a level of service problem, and we think it'll be by the time this fall comes around, it'll be these two segments that we're talking about. We need to be, we, need, we have integrity. We, we want to make sure that our level of service is set correctly and we've got the projects identified and funded. We've got them identified, we've got them funded, they're, they're under design, but it looks like they're going to be delayed. So we're, we're being consistent in our own comprehensive plan policy, but we don't have the hammer that we had before 2011. Now, in practice, did we ever, since 1990, 2011, did we ever stop issuance of a permit for concurrency? No, we did not. Um, we kept up with our roadway capacity or we changed the level of service like on 27th Avenue, 43rd Avenue, South County. City of Vero Beach changed the level of service on A1A because they didn't want to widen A1A. Same thing there. So this is a way of kind of being, you know, the kind of the honest accounting of what is our level of service and our transportation capital planning. Um, through our capital planning and looking at the timing of these identified improvements, we, we said what we need to do is reflect reality in, in the plan and, and set the level of service appropriately and do it just on an interim basis because we know these projects are coming. We just don't think they're going to be here, say, in the next three years. We think it's going to be longer than that. The other thing I, I wanted to say, too, that's already an exemption in um, – in our current concurrency is uh, for single family permits for older lots, lots that were platted before 1990, Vero Lake Estates, Sebastian Highlands. What's putting the trips on County Road 510 these last 10 years? It has not been new projects in the unincorporated area. They haven't been built. They haven't put rooftops there. It's been what's already exempt from concurrency, trips from Vero Lake Estates, from Sebastian Highlands. Um, and so basically what's happened is a, is, is a timing issue, and that's, that's kind of what's reflected here. I don't know of any other jurisdiction. A lot of times I look to Martin County on concurrency because they're pretty strict. They exempt every single single-family permit is exempt from concurrency review there. I don't know of any other county that still has that on the books, and um, we think that the best way forward is to – Put that as a de minimis on each individual permit, but track the cumulative effect of single family permits and have that factored into traffic studies, especially looking for any offsite turn lanes or intersection improvements that this board might, uh, might attach to a, a project approval going forward. 
But again, these are the only two concerns we have in the county uh, at this point in time are those two roadway segments. That's why we're focusing in on it. Uh, it's a long explanation, but I wanted to kind of um, give you the big picture. I'll stick on the original sure. question and come back to that single family because I don't quite understand the single family sure. thing. But in any event, um, the, the projections you're making um, that this fall will exceed capacity, um, where does, I'm thinking of all the, the developments we have approved between say 53rd and 510. Right. Uh, you got the reserve going in at Grand, I'm thinking mm -hmm. 200 units. The next one, Spoonbill something or other, going up to 63rd, 800 units. You cross the street, you got um, Lost Tree, 69th, 400 units roughly. Right. 65th, we approved something, 300 and some mm -hmm. odd units. I think there was 71 units to the just west of that. Where do these couple thousand units fit into the discussion that, that you just had about capacity and plans, et cetera? Sure. So with each traffic study for those projects, we look, are they going to put any traffic? Are they going to produce traffic that's going to go on those segments in any meaningful sense? Or are they an attractor, especially like a job creation type of project? And in those cases, none of them put enough trips to, to trip looking at 510 or 37th Street in terms of these these particular areas that are here. Now, I think generally, you know, certainly more rooftops you have, people will go everywhere. It'll it'll be part of the background traffic that's gonna that's factored into traffic studies that'll be be coming along. So, I don't think um, it it really has anything to do with those two particular segments. It has to do with the cross streets uh, and US one and 58th Avenue. And again, we've looked at those, and none of those projects trip it. Any, any of those. Um, but what we do tend to see are turn lane requirements, having to move up intersection improvements on the county schedule. You all see 800 units, 200 units, it's a lot of units. How soon are those actually gonna get here? When are all those gonna be built out? We still have a pretty slow absorption rate compared to metro areas to our north and to our south. Uh, and that's given us time, I think, to plan for the improvements that we need. Um, but in this particular discussion, None of what we're proposing here would have impacted what those studies said or the impacts that we think those projects are going to have. Um, but they will contribute to background traffic that eventually, over a longer period of time, I think would, would impact these segments. I think we'll have these projects constructed by then. The, um, what was I going to say? Well, let's go to the single family sure. homes. All those projects we just talked about are single family homes, I think. I mean, there may be some yes. multi in there someplace. <laughs> right. So how does this single family home exemption that, that you're putting in here relate to all those 2,000 homes that are coming in under those projects? Right, so the traffic study is gonna look at the impacts in the aggregate, all right? At, you know, build out over however many years the developer says, you know, five years it's gonna be built out. We're gonna look at all the traffic that it proposes, 10 years is gonna be built out. And they're gonna look at all the different segments and see is it significant enough impact to, uh, to cause, first of all, a concurrency problem with what's programmed or intersection uh, problems. And there's a lot of capacity in the central county, especially US 1, a lot of the cross streets and so forth. Um, still on 58th Avenue, obviously there's a lot of capacity on 66th Avenue where it's four lane. So when we, the models are run and they look at all that, they're looking at the aggregate impacts of those. What this change is saying is, we're not gonna look at each, track each and every single family permit over the life of that project and every time do a whole new concurrency review with a fractional trip from that single family on segment X, Y, or Z. So we're, we're cutting out a concurrency review for fractional trips from an individual single family home ad nauseum out into the future. We're looking at it in the aggregate. But you will still at the inception, when someone comes in and says, I'm gonna develop this piece of land, I'm gonna put 800 yes. single family homes in there. We will get a traffic study and we'll look at the impacts in the aggregate based on their projected build out. Okay. Which for a larger, the larger the project, the longer the build out. Uh, but I've never seen anybody come in uh, and say, you know, in reality, this is gonna take 25 years to build out, which some larger projects do. They usually set it for a shorter time frame. 
uh, but it's still a valid way to look at the, the aggregate impacts, and that's, what, what, that's the type of information we have and that you all look at when you look at our, our traffic and, and required improvements section of our staff reports for various projects. And the, the underlying premise that we're operating here on to, ex to increase the level of service to D plus 20% right. is that <coughs> we have these road projects out in the future that when they're built, that will increase capacity back down so we won't need the 20%. Correct. Okay. Do you have any idea in the world when these roads are going to be built? I notice we don't even have the land. There's right-of-way acquisition <laughs> required, et cetera. We're right, sure, sure. A, a couple of things. Let's take it one at a time. So, so on 510, that is a 80 to 90 million dollar project. If you go all the way from 512 to US 1, kind of through that intersection, DOT will probably break it down into segments. We've requested, and they're focusing more on the eastern segments, which is where the, the capacity issue we think will will arise sooner. Um, so I, we think the actual construction is probably five to eight years out for that. In concurrency world, if, if, it's, if you, get, you get it under construction within three years, you count it as capacity. That's the way the, the, the setup is now. Um, so concurrency world-wise, you're, you know, you're two, maybe four years out from being within three years of it starting. Uh, the reason concurrency does that is because the impacts, the rooftops, the people, the cars, they don't all happen, you know, right away. It, it, it builds out over time. So that's, that's the way that I would see that, that kind of thing playing out for 510. For 37th Street, we have the right-of-way for four-laning it and widening it now. So if the new right-of-way that's needed for that, and we've been in discussions with property owners so far, it's been positive for the new route. But if, if something were to hold that up and we weren't able to get right of way for some reason for that, we've got, we go back to the 37th Street widening project and, and we do that and we have the right of way for that. Um, so I think based on funding and the track of both of those projects, uh, you know, we're gonna see them both. I think we're gonna see 37th Street or the extension within five years. And I think it's probably more in the five to eight years we're gonna see DOT start construction on 510. Um, yeah, I think that's the timing for that. Mr. Chairman, uh, Mr. Plucklett, uh, if I could fill in a little bit. The intersection at 510 US 1 needs to be redesigned. Um, its original design was not going to be functional. So it's going to be redesigned and it's going to lessen the amount of right of way that's necessary from uh, the corners, especially the CVS there, the gas station, and the other ones. 510. Uh, further down the way uh, as you head west is already under the um, right-of-way acquisition uh, 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 phase of the project. Uh, they're talking to the larger landowners, Graves Brothers along the way there, as far as what their plans are, how they can incorporate uh, the design of the road. Uh, there's going to be a design change there as well. It's my understanding that they're going to allow the utility transmission lines on the south side of 510 to remain, and they are going to move the canal to the north. So the right-of-way acquisition will come from the majority of the north rather than the south as you proceed along 510. And at 37th and Indian River Boulevard, that intersection there is going to be teed. It's instead of having it at a, such an angle, the angle is going to be increase so that it's more closer to a 90 degree intersection, a functional, a functional T intersection, which the public works folks tell me that they should be able to move traffic through the intersection faster in its improved condition. All the right of way is, has been purchased for that parcel. Thank you, Bill. Any further questions? Um, the next step in this process is for uh, this document to go to a uh, Board of County Commissioners with our recommendation. Correct. I'm assuming this is a living document and somebody in your office looks at it every day and finds little mistakes. So will the document that goes to Board of County Commissioners be different than the document we've seen? If we find mistakes, certainly. And, and if you find any, let us know. Okay. <laughs> because ser seriously, that's... We, we will go through, we, we will refine it, we'll look at it, re-look re, re at it. We wouldn't make any substantive changes, but if we found errors, certainly we would, we would make that. 
And w there's also, that won't be the only time the Board of County Commissioners sees it. If they decide for it to move forward, it'll be probably three or four months after June that that would actually come back for potentially final adoption. Well, the next step is it goes to the state, right? Correct. And Correct. so the document that goes to the state may be slightly different than the one we've seen, although no substantive changes, just minor editorial changes. That's correct. And our practice is, has always been that if there are any <clears throat> changes, let's say the board directs changes, we'll report that back to you all so you know what's, you know, what's different. If there are, um, doesn't happen very often, but that way you all know that if there are any, any changes based on what you all looked at. Uh, but this basically, this will be, this is your chance tonight. This is, this is where you all weigh in and it'll, it'll go from there, but I, I would be surprised if we had any substantive changes unless the board wanted to pursue a different policy than they've already directed us to take. So when does this become a clean document and who reviews that final document? Okay, what, we're, a clean document, finalized? Right, adopted. final, yep, all the, if, if all the Mueller redactions taken out and, yeah. and, and a clean document that's easy to review. Once it becomes adopted, we'll, we'll take all the strike through and under, underline out. So we're looking at if we target September for the final hearing at the Board of County Commissioners, um, we send it off uh, to the state. And then there's once they receive it, there's like a 31-day time period for waiting, uh, and then once it's um, that time period runs out, then it's finalized. So once all the changes are taken out, then it's reviewed at staff level, and then that is the document. Any further questions? I do. Uh, regarding the 510, you mentioned the priority is the intersection uh, on the east side. Um, what about the, the paper subdivisions, uh, Liberty Village, Liberty Park, I can't remember the name of yeah, it. Yeah, Liberty there. Park, right. Okay, Liberty Park through there. I mean, at this point in time, you're accounting for those slots or not, as far as the concurrency? Right, they have not reserved capacity, they have not paid impact fees. And you're right, that's, that's, that is part of the timing equation, right? You, you approve things on paper and they, you know, we, we generally have the absorption rate we have. Now, we had quite an aberration in 2005, 2006, 2007, but then a lot of the traffic didn't come because those, those sat empty for quite some time. So uh, you're correct, but each time that any segment, say, of Liberty Park were to come through for your review, it would be a subdivision. You all would see it. They would have to do a traffic study for that unit. Say it's what they propose, and we've seen is maybe an 80-lot subdivision part of it between the school and 66th Avenue. That might be what you might see first from Liberty Park. They would do a traffic study for those 80 lots. You'd see the aggregate impacts of that uh, and, and apply it. Um, so you'll probably see things like that in phases. You'll see it in segments. And that's how that will be evaluated. And they always have the option of prepaying the traffic impact. They do. The guarantee, but as you mentioned, nobody's doing that anymore. And I think there were some people trying to claw back some of what they paid at one point in time as well. That has been the case. Most of them have gotten used eventually though. And then um, 37th Street accounts, uh, we know what it's like right now driving through there a lot of times, but um, the D plus the 20 is tying into the potential either widening or the road through the backside of um, the golf course property. Yes. Okay. And that's a five year time frame we're looking at? Yes. Okay. And then it will go back to a D. Do we have any other? roads that are D at this point in time, or D plus? Well, we, we have, there are different flavors, right? So there, we have E plus 20, which is even <coughs> worse than D, right? Down in the two segments in the South County, 27th Avenue and 43rd Avenue. So we're not, change, not proposing to change that. Um, oddly enough, it, as it turns out, the, um, I think some of the projections of, of where that, that those roadway segments would be have have not come nearly as quickly. They're not nearly as um, congested as maybe the projections would have been 12 years ago. Um, nonetheless, E plus 20, we're, we're not touching that. That decision's been made. Don't four-lane 
five lane. I've got a whole place in my brain that tells me that for those, those uh, two roadway segments. Um, these are the two, 37th and, and 510, th those, are the, those are the two. Um, as we've drilled down a little bit, I will also let you know that s the most recent capacity tables um, capacity tables do change. So level service D might mean 880 trips on a two-lane roadway now, and then when you get a revised version, now we're down to 800 or 820. That's happened when we've gone through this exercise to use the latest DOT numbers and guidance. So we actually um, lost capacity based on DOT guidance. So we've, we've had increases in traffic. We've had some delays in the project, which is the main reason, but we also had some of those capacity numbers come down. So we've gotten there a little bit quicker than I would have told you a year and a half ago because DOT guidance is different now. If that made any sense to you at all. Mm -hmm. oh, yeah. Good. Yeah. At least two of you got it. Great. 43rd is the question that I had yep. regarding because anything no changes north of that. 60 seems to be accumulating traffic. Yes. Now, fortunately for that, the, um, the 43rd State Road 60 intersection improvement is going to go down a little bit past 18th Street to the north and up to 26th Street. And so those intersections and those, those approaches should widen out and get capacity and get better movement through movement as you, as you get towards State Road 60. Uh, and that project is, I guess, has kind of just started. Hasn't there been some of the preliminary... Uh, All the right-of-way right. acquisition for that intersection has been complete. Uh, DOT has certified the right-of-way. Uh, we're awaiting final uh, construction documents, bid docs. Uh, I would anticipate construction sometime late summer, early fall. So what was in front of um, Nino's? Was that preliminary? Yes, what we did in front of Nino's is we, we went ahead and improved our right-of-way because it's a combination of city and county right-of-way that they were using for parking for their buildings. We have improved the drive aisles so there's organization to it instead of just kind of scattered parking. And we've, eliminated, or we've taken the sections that we need for right-of-way, for road building, for turn lanes, out of the mix. So when that finished product, when that's a finished product, you'll begin to start to see the shape of the roadway as far as at the intersection. But the next thing that you're going to see is the demolition of the buildings. Anything further? Is there any criteria in either state law or our comp plan or someplace else that says how you define a level of service? Yes, level of service is an accepted standard amongst traffic engineers, and so DOT has standards that um, what's a level of service A, what's B, what's C, what's D, what's E, uh, where there are, where they do have a measurement for E, and what those level of services, it is, the way that they're described is qualitative in terms of the, uh, the ease of flow of traffic. It really relates to the flow uh, and, and capacity is related to that. They also drill down into the characteristics of the actual roadway segment itself, number of signals, uh, how it's built, roadside recovery area, the width of the lanes, does it have a median or not, uh, how it's striped. So they take these functions and they have tables and guidance that give you hard numbers. The hard numbers are tied to a qualitative sort of ease of flow uh, concept. There are other ways to measure uh, capacity. I'm not an expert in it myself. I mean, some are are more tied to the, um, the travel time through a network. It's a little more complicated. This is actually the easy way to do it, level service numbers and so forth, because it's easy to quantify. Uh, it could very well be that in years to come, it will be, we'll have enough information and data to do more travel time type of level of service, rather than go with these D numbers, E numbers, and so forth. The numbers are set forth in the Florida Level of Service Handbook. Is that the, am I accurate on that? There, I'm not sure what the handbook is, Phil. Yeah, maybe give the document. Hi, Phil Matson, MPO Staff Director. First of all, I've known Stan 17 years. I didn't know he knew so much about transportation. <laughs> His answers are absolutely spot on correct. Uh, it's called the DOT Generalized Level of Service Tables, and it's an appendix to the FDOT Handbook. 
The handbook comes out, a new one comes out about every five years. And the technical basis for the DOT handbook is a national, uh, it's called HCM, HCS, Highway Capacity Manual. And this is done by the Transportation Research Board. So it's a national standard. You know, I was thinking about what you were asking, uh, Mr. Plackwitz, and they draw the line somewhere on A, B, C, D uh, on the continuum of flow of traffic. But generally, A and B, you can go the speed limit. At C, you've got some interrupted flow. The speed limit might be 45 and you can go, you know, 35. There, there are actually speeds tied to it. Uh, when you get into D and F on an intersection basis, which doesn't relate to our concurrency system, it's the link basis, but on an intersection basis, a failing intersection would be you not getting through on one cycle. So you, um, light turns green, you get closer, but you don't actually get through. That's called cycle failure. So. Okay. And, I, and I guess why I, I raised that, I noticed that one of the changes you're seeking, we haven't talked about it, but was to give the public works director uh, basically discretion to not use those tables and use any other generally accepted method for determining capacity. I understood that. Right, there are different types of, of models and, and, and as <coughs> Phil's at the, at the podium, so I'll pick on them a little bit. Thanks, Phil. Um, for <coughs> different accepted models that are, that are used, it's not like it's a uh, completely foreign language to what DOT uses in, in the handbook, but there are ways of, of really drilling down and really looking at specific characteristics of the roadway and doing almost like a modeling of that particular roadway and what the capacity is, rather than just pulling it off the table. But it has to be accepted practice, and it has to be approved by, by the Public Works Director. Yeah, and I'm not going to bore you with that much detail, but the, the first word on every table is generalized. So if you have a two-lane roadway um, with a posted speed above 40 miles per hour, that could range from Dixie Highway around 4th Street, <coughs> or that could be, um, I don't know, a road that goes much faster, 510 west of uh, 66th. You know, in 510 west of 66, you can go 70 miles an hour at night. You know, on Dixie Highway, you've got driveways every 150 feet. So it's generalized. It's, it's categorized for general characteristics of comparable roadways, and the same level of service applies. So what the public works director can do is drill down in a specific instance and identify what the actual level of service is by running more detailed table, you know, analysis. So I think that's what that would do, that would give him that capability. We don't have the capability to analyze every segment of every roadway in its actual level of service standard. So we apply the generalized table, and that's what all jurisdictions do. I guess the fear that I had when I looked at this, this agenda item, <clears throat> I was trying to determine if we're, well, what's driving the, the, the uh, level of service? Is it principles of good communities, good traffic flow, things like that? Or is it simply the actual reality on the street? If the actual reality goes up and exceeds our level of service, we just increase our level of service, and now we're back in compliance. Um, and I, I guess more than anything, I want to feel comfortable that we're not just adjusting the level of service. We're not just approving all this development, putting cars on the road, and uh, exceeding our level of service, so we just increase our level of service, and now we just keep going on the same path, and 20 years from now, we're gonna be clogged up with all kinds of traffic. Um, and, I, and I guess I want you to, to assure me that no, we're not just setting standards based on um, the actual traffic, we're actually trying to set the other way. We're trying to set the, the traffic based on the standards. Right. You're exactly right. We, we are trying to apply the same standard, and we, and we have two instances where we believe that, that we do, on an interim basis, need to, need to set a different standard because we have a way forward. You know, if I looked at um, 510 and said, you know, we don't even have a project plan, we have, you know, but we, we got to come up with $90 million in the next 10 years, um, we would have failed. <laughs> so. We haven't done that, and a lot of that's credit to the, of the MPO, you know, the, the countywide transportation planning. Um, it's not something that we're doing lightly, coming here with, and this is a great, dis great discussion to have. Um, we have the fix, and it's a good long-term fix. In fact, our whole grid is a good long-term fix. It tends to break down at the intersections, and that's what we really need to take care of, turn lanes and intersections, for a lot of it. 
For some of these, we need to go multi-lane or we need to build whole new roadways. And I think the county's done a good job doing that. And so we're not, we're not changing our standards. I think we're recognizing that it's gonna, for that size project for 510, it's gonna take longer to get there. And it's something that the county on its own could not get there. We could not build a $90 million project for the county. Um, we've gotta have DOT <coughs> doing that. Now the reason for 37th Street is a little bit different. We've got the right of way, we've had it funded, but we think a better idea is that Aviation Boulevard extension for a number of reasons and Phil's been a real, really out front in, in, in leading that idea as well as public works in the county and the city as well. Um, so we think that delay is worth pursuing that other alternative and if we, if we don't get there with right of way then we'll just, we'll four lane what we've got and we'll have capacity. Um, but I don't think it will function as well as if we have the other. We're not changing our standard. We're, we're doing this to be honest. We're doing this to uh, keep ourselves on track in getting a huge project done by DOT and they're, they're really the only ones that could do it. That North County needs that project. Well, but you're also putting the parties that may be affected by it on notice as well that if they don't wanna pay the impact fees, they take their chances. That's right. But um, I guess, w have we, in recent times, adjusted any roadways and, you know, went from a D to a D20 or, you know, that I'm aware Yeah, j j 27th, 43rd, the, the last two we have, and like I said, the city uh, on segments of A1A decided, you know, for, for other reasons, not to do a widening of that. Um, although, again, a lot of times you'll see the breakdowns at intersections first. Those you really need to to key in on. The other thing I, I did want to mention, because John actually slipped me a note, and you know, there have been times where we've done kind of public-private partnerships where you have a large enough project like a waterway village put through 53rd Street, oversize it with additional county money to make it four lanes, all they needed was two lanes, to put 43rd Avenue extension through in the later phases of the project to get that grid out there and get people to be able to use the capacity on the roadways that have it. And now they're gonna come in and widen 58th Avenue, Waterway Village. The county's partnering with them to make that widening longer to go up to 57th and a little bit past 57th. Middle school and all that, um, all that traffic will be able to use a wider segment where, where they're making maneuvers east and west, all the way down past 49th Street. So there are times when we do work with developers to get projects done and uh, they pay their impact fees or they get impact fee credit and we pay extra money and get segments done. Uh, so some, some of these larger projects like Waterway, we've actually had segment improvements done, not just intersections. So appreciate John slipping me that note. It, is it, it's been discussed, and I've, over the course of time, I've had discussions with uh, private parties about it, but the, um, the, the methodology of five o'clock in the afternoon at peak season, and there are builders and so forth, why are we using the most extreme? That is a tr that is a measurement that is consistent across the state. It is. Yeah. yeah. But as Stan mentioned, uh, the thing that's changed the most in my career doing this is what people consider, you know, the appropriate way to measure transportation and what your objective for transportation is. <clears throat> and they're increasingly replacing this conventional level of service flow uh, capacity model with what they call predictability and reliability measures. So. In some cases, it's waving a white flag. You know, we know we're gonna have a lot of traffic. Uh, is the peak hour traffic relative to the daily flow 20% worse? Is it 40% worse? And then what's the unpredictability of it? Are you likely to go out and need to do something, make a delivery, do some logistic thing, and once every four days, you're gonna have double and triple the time it will take you. So are there incident management issues too? So that's what the whole planning process is wrestling with now. Should we keep looking to try to make sure that everybody can drive approximately the speed limit, which is what level of service is? Or should we try to keep a handle on the predictability and reliability of the system, maybe sacrifice a little bit of speed on the roads, and in the process increase safety, which has gotten a lot worse. So it's been, been kind of a big change. And as of now, all jurisdictions are still doing vehicle capacity ratio. Some are tempering that with these other measures. And I, I, I want to bring up on it, I expect a hook to come out of here sometime. It's getting late, you know, it's a little hot in here too. But um, Mr. Plaquitz brought, brought a point up. And what gives me a lot of confidence in the way our planning process works is the MPO 
plan is prescribed by a federal methodology. It works a little bit differently from the county comprehensive plan, but every five years we do a new long range transportation plan. And we are seeded with a future population number from the Bureau of Economic and Business Research, University of Florida. And we work backward from that number. So if we say that's our future number for 2045, uh, what will we need to do to maintain our level of service standard on the roadways? What will we have to widen? What kind of land use changes do we have to make? We update that every five years. And the kind of interesting thing is we are now in a process to take a look at our very first long range plan, the reality of it. Because we adopted it in 93 and it was a 2020 plan. And it was absolutely uncanny how, how good it was. Um, the Bieber figure from the University of Florida for us was a population of 155,000. We're gonna get there, we're gonna about 154 we're gonna have, I, I figure, by next year. So it's like within 1% on a 25 year horizon, which is a pretty good forecast. Then it told us all the roads we'd need to do and it's the stuff we've been doing over the last 25 years. Widening US 1 south of uh, 4th Street. Uh, State Road 60 widening to six lanes, you know, through it, over by the mall. Um, about the only thing we didn't do, 53rd Street, everything we'd done that was on the plan, widening Oslo, widening 512, about the only thing we didn't do was 510. And as Stan mentioned, we have a, we have a, it's had a few stops and starts, but I think we have a pretty good head of steam on it now. So we, we kind of go long, I guess, if you wanted a metaphor at the MPO by taking the future population forecast and building backward on what we'll need to do to maintain what we want for level of service. And they take an iterative approach where every new development that comes in every day, they measure its impact on level of service. And the two processes are, are fully integrated, so. Bill, is the uh, FDOT handbook available online? Yeah, absolutely. Um, I'll put the link out to whoever staffs this. Great, great, thanks. Yeah, and I'll give you my contact information. It's a, in how to interpret it and how to work it. You know, you can, you can take any road and look it up. It's a, it's a matrix, but you need certain roadway characteristics. You need about 10 characteristics to be able to find the road's level of service. Thank you, Bill. Okay. Appreciate it. Any further questions? I'll open up the public hearing. If you'd like to speak, please stand up and be sworn in. I see none. I'll close the public hearing. Gentlemen, any further questions, motion? Motion approved. Motion approved by Jordan. Second. Seconded by Dr. Day. All in favor? Aye. 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 It's unanimous. Okay, next order of business, commissioner's matters. Are there any? There are none. Next order of business, planning matters, Stan. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. So your next meeting is May 9th, and we do have a public hearing scheduled for a land development regulation amendment proposal, so we would love to see you all on May 9th. Anything else, Dan? That's it. Next order of business, attorneys matters. I have nothing. Meeting adjourned.